Hey everyone, as we begin the season of Advent, we are now in the first week of that season and building up to Christmas Day and Christmas Eve. And I want to spend just a few minutes sharing some thoughts on this first week of Advent. Uh, Advent is a time of waiting. In fact, it means, that word means arrival or waiting. And it is a time that we wait expectantly. Uh, Christians began to celebrate the season of Advent in the 4th and 5th centuries. And like Mary, we anticipate the arrival of Jesus, first as a child, and also we anticipate uh, Jesus' arrival one day when he comes back and returns. Uh, this first arrival of Jesus as a baby, as a child, represents what God has already done, accomplishing God's purposes in the arrival of Christ. But we also celebrate and wait in expectation for Christ's return, the full coming of God's reign on earth. And this represents what God will do in the future. And this waiting that we are engaged in is not a passive waiting. It's, it's an active waiting. As any expectant mother knows, waiting for the arrival of a child involves preparation. It involves exercise. It involves nutrition. It involves care. It involves prayer. It involves work. And our active waiting involves things like service and fasting, prayer, and giving our attention to heaven, things that are to come thinking about Christ's return and actively anticipating what that will be like. If you're watching this and you're a part of the KCOC family, those are all things that are actually things to Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 6, which was the reading for today in the Advent reading guide that we sent out. And I'm sure that it's not lost on any of us that we are celebrating Advent while in a year like that we're like we're in we're we're in a season of waiting a season that's designed to help us wait and anticipate and we're living in a time when we're waiting and anticipating something that is coming you might say like mary that we are during this season pregnant with hope waiting and longing and anticipating for god to do something new I want you to listen to the way that Mary talks about anticipating Jesus' arrival in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 46. This is a song that Mary sings. She says, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for God has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. His holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. God has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever just as he promised our ancestors. I don't know if you can hear in those words, but Mary is ready for Jesus to arrive, to, to see that in Christ the fulfillment of all the things that have been promised to Abraham and all his ancestors will come to pass. She could not wait. She was longing for a new day to dawn, for the proud to be brought low and the, the, those who are low to be exalted. God was doing a new thing, and she believed that this baby's arrival would change the world forever. Interestingly, another thing happens in Luke chapter 1. You should go back and read it for yourself, but I want to kind of summarize basically what happens. In, in, earlier in Luke chapter 1, an angel visits Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, and an angel also visits Mary. When the angel tells Zechariah that his wife, Elizabeth, is going to have a baby, John the Baptist can't believe it, quite honestly. He's very old, and so is his wife, uh, wife Elizabeth, at this point in their life. He's so shocked that he says to the angel of the Lord, How can I be sure of this? How can I be sure of this? And because his, he asked this angel this question, the angel made him mute, unable to speak until John the Baptist was born. But then, just a couple of verses later, an angel also asks, also visits Mary to, visit, to tell her that she is going to carry Jesus in her womb. And you know what she asks? She says, how will this be? 
when you're reading the stories side by side without being able to hear inflection in their voice and just sort of reading it on a page, it almost sounds like that they're asking the same question. They both see some obstacle in the way and they want an answer. Zachariah and Elizabeth are old in age and he's curious, how can I be sure of this? And Mary is a virgin. How can she possibly have a baby in her womb? But the interesting thing is that Mary doesn't lose her ability to speak. The angel just answers her question. So there has to be a difference, right? I mean, one person is made mute and unable to speak, and the other person gets their question answered. But they both ask really similar questions. How can I be sure of this, and how will this be? And I think that the difference is in how they ask their question. I think Zachariah asked his, how can I be sure of this question with a tone of doubt, almost as if he wasn't really sure that it was going to believe and he needed some proof, some evidence. How can I be sure of this actually happening? And Mary, I think, asks her question with a, a tone of anticipation. How will this be? A tone of excitement and longing for this, this thing that has been promised to actually happen. How will it be? And I don't know if you hear the difference. One, a tone of doubt, and the other, a tone of anticipation. And really, I mean, who can blame Zechariah? Isn't it hard for you to believe that God is going to return? I know it's hard for me at times to think that, that God is still going to return because all we've known is this life. All we've ever known is what we live and experience every single day. So it's hard to imagine at times that something better will be revealed in the future, which is why I think that we need seasons like Advent, especially this year. I think we feel the fatigue. We, we feel what the Bible calls an ache, a groan. You might have a hard time imagining Christ's return, but I am certain that you do not have a hard time imagining a return to normal life. We're longing for something to change. We're ready for something to change. We're ready to stop talking about COVID-19. We're ready for the promises that have been made over the last several months to come to pass. We're ready for the future to march into the present. And this is what it feels like and what it means to be pregnant with hope. And if you feel this ache at all in your soul, in your spirit right now, I encourage you to lean into it. I encourage you during this season to take advantage of it because God will use it to teach you and to encourage you. What it means is, is that we are in the pains of labor, to use Paul's words from Romans chapter 8. And labor pains, childbirth, the process involves pain and blood and tears and joy and community. It's called labor for a reason. And I think it's important to remember in this particular season of waiting, of longing for 2021, of also longing for Christ's return, that we remember that we are in this season of waiting. Something better is coming. And so my encouragement for you today is this. Let's live like Mary, with more anticipation than doubt, believing in faith that Jesus' return will change everything, just like Mary believed that his first arrival would be the fulfillment of the Old Testament promise for a Messiah. And as we wait, may our waiting be active, knowing that while we are here on earth, there is still kingdom work left to do. How will this be? We anticipate and we wait. God bless.